Welcome to Doing the Work, the frontline stories of social change, where we bring you stories of real people working to address real issues. I am your host, Shimon Cohen. Hey everyone, this is Shimon. I'm really excited to announce a new collaboration with Florida International University's Disability Resource Center. The Disability Resource Center has offered to provide transcription services for the podcast. This is really exciting and the transcripts will be available in the show notes and also on the podcast website. Thank you so much to the FIU Disability Resource Center. Okay, here's this month's episode. In this episode, I talk with Eric Ward, who is the Executive Director of Western State Center in Portland, Oregon. Eric has years of organizing against white supremacy with a particular focus on white nationalist organizations. He details how anti-Semitism and racism are at the core of white nationalism and encourages us to understand the problem in order to address it. Eric explains how white nationalism is a growing social movement in the U.S. that is building political power and having a major impact on legislative policy. We've seen this with the current administration's immigration policy and clear connection to white nationalism. Eric shares strategies Western State Center uses to organize, such as local research shared with civil rights organizations, coalition building, school-based materials and trainings, and provides a variety of ways everyone can fight white nationalism. He also talks about how he got into this work. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hey, Eric, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you, and I'm so glad that we finally made this happen. And just to start things off, could you let the listeners know what you currently do? Yeah, so my name is Eric Ward, and I am executive director of Western State Center. Western State Center is based in the Pacific Northwest and Mountain States, and we work nationwide to strengthen inclusive democracy meaning people-centered government that is accountable and transparent by building movements, developing leaders, engaging in culture, and defending democracy. That sounds like a lot to do. It's a big task, and it's gotten much busier over the last few years, as you can imagine. Yeah, and you know, there's so much we could talk about, and I really want to jump right into your work organizing against white supremacy. I think it's a critically important topic. And, you know, most of our listeners are social workers, social work students, educators, also, you know, activists. But it's it's a really important topic for our field as well. And you've been doing this work for a long time. So if you could just really start by talking about, you know, how do you organize against white supremacy? Yeah, so I think there's an important uh, uh, pieces here uh, before we can even get to that answer, but I'm going to try to be succinct. You know, my friends who know me know I grew up Southern Baptist, so, you know, we, we can't do anything under 30 minutes, but <laughs> I'm going to try to make this like a really succinct two-minute conversation. So what's important to know is that we live in a democracy, and um, what that means is that people do matter in the shaping of society and the shaping of government. Now, that's been contested terrain. I'm not here to to paint some kind of unicorn and rainbow story. That is contested. Democracy, at the end of the day, has always been about people forcing government and other elements to center the importance of community and transparency and accountability. In the United States, the the biggest battle for uh, democracy and democratic practice uh, occurs around the 1960s civil rights movement. It is a civil rights movement that is largely driven by African Americans, but not all, who are living under Jim Crow and systemic segregation in American society. They mobilize to challenge segregation. They are successful and they overturn de jure white supremacy. And what I mean by white supremacy is a system of government that was based on the idea that a portion of the population was superior based off of skin color, and that a portion of the population was inferior based off of their skin color. It's hard to imagine now 
But there was a time when this was the rule of law, right? It wasn't a debate in our society. It wasn't a political fight. It was the conventional wisdom. And the civil rights movement defeated that. When I say it defeated de jure white supremacy, I don't mean white supremacy as a system of racial disparity and misogyny, right? And stolen resources and genocide of Native people disappeared in the night. It's certainly still very much a challenge in culture and economy. But it is important to note that white supremacy has a political idea, right, where government function under those laws no longer exists. So imagine you believe in Jim Crow, you believe in segregation, and you believe Black people are inferior. You wake up one night and you realize Black folks have made democracy actually come to America and represent everyone. How do you explain that you lost to people you have been raised to think of as inferior. You're never going to admit that you have lost to people you have been raised to see as inferior. So those segregationists looked for a scapegoat. And the scapegoat that they found was the Jew, right? And it is the introduction of a more systemic form of anti-Semitism, right, that comes into play in American political thinking. Again, I'm not saying anti-Semitism and white supremacy didn't exist right before the 1960s. What I'm saying is that racism and anti-Semitism take on different roles in the post-civil rights as an answer to the segregationist wonderment of their own defeat. And white supremacy, a system, gives birth to a social movement called white nationalism. So here we are in 2019, and clearly there's been a rise of white nationalism, Yes, right? This is well-documented. There's been an increase in hate crimes. There's been an increase of hate crimes against Jews, of which I'm a member of that community, and that fear of, wait, this things might not be safe anymore for us is absolutely real. There's been mass shootings, there's been an increase of at least publicized police brutality and killings of black folks. And of course, the scapegoating and hatred of immigrants and particularly Muslims and also immigrants from Latin America. So in this context, where do you even start to organize? Yeah, no, I think it's a really good question about in the wake of all this, where do you start organizing? And and what we tell folks is where you start is by first understanding the problem, right? And the, the problem is this, is that what was once a contained fringe social movement, the white nationalist movement, is morphing into a mass movement with significant public support, right? Some polls have shown that uh, white nationalism has the public support sometimes of almost a third of Americans, depending on how questions are framed, right? That is significant. What we believe is that there is an opportunity to mobilize and to push white nationalism back to the margins and to expand opportunities for racial justice, immigrant rights, gender justice, and most importantly, reestablishing democratic practice in the United States. How do we do that? The first step, I think, as I said before, is educating oneself and understanding that we're dealing with two different phenomena. We are dealing with a social movement called white nationalism, which is committed to ethnic cleansing, right? And to be plain, it is about the creation of a white-only ethnostate through the removal of people of color, immigrants, and Jews, right? It feeds off of, but is distinct from the system of white supremacy that existed in the United States based off of racial disparity. In short, if white supremacy is a system, white nationalism is a social movement. White supremacy is about exploitation. White nationalism is about forced removal. It is important that we don't confuse them because they have different goals and they function differently historically. 
White supremacy is driven by anti-blackness. White nationalism is fueled by anti-Semitism. If we are truly going to confront white nationalism, we have to do so by first understanding anti-Semitism, right? It is the key to denying fuel to the white nationalist movement. So I tell folks this, educate yourself around white nationalism. Two, join an organization. You have to be in some kind of organization, whether that's your knitting club, whether that is your congregation, whether it's the real estate association, or whether it's an organization like Western State Center. There is not much that we can do individually. The white nationalist movement is not out spreading anti-Semitism or racism or Islamophobia or other forms of bigotry simply to spread bigotry. It is using bigotry to build political power. And that political power has had a significant impact on policy, whether we're talking about immigration, whether we're talking about how hate crimes are investigated in this country, or whether we're talking about holding accountable elected officials who use bigotry to stir up their electoral bases. It's important to understand anti-Semitism is not just a phenomena of the right. It is something that white nationalists are tapping into. If movements on the left or right are tapping into anti-Semitism, it is because anti-Semitism exists in mainstream society. And so beyond education, the next thing we can do is to actually challenge anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry. And as I said, we are most effective doing that by being part of an organization, joining with other members. So let's say people become a part of an organization, you know, what are some of the things, what are some of the strategies that you all have used to challenge white nationalism? Yes. So we have engaged, I think, in uh, significant work, right? So we have uh, worked locally to research, right, what is happening in our community and to share that information with civil rights, human rights groups, and and business communities. We work locally to engage in national coalitions, right, to bridge that research with action. We develop new leaders, right? We hold annual training programs uh, around the country. We tour by working with other organizations to provide tools, such as our Confronting White Nationalism in Schools Toolkit. Uh, which is a toolkit that has now been distributed to over 4,000 educators uh, in every state in the country and eight countries outside the U.S. But along with the toolkit, we have held train the trainers, right, to make sure that teachers and educators are able to gain some experience around how to use the ideas in the toolkit. So if I were going to give an individual some specific things that they could do, The first is this, join an organization. You're going to hear me say that a hundred times over the next 20 minutes or so that we have left. Join that organization. It doesn't have to be a political organization. It can be a cultural organization, right? It can be a social service, but be an organization. In that organization, you should have a conversation with others, right? About how we can begin to model right? What a multiracial, a multicultural democracy looks like, right? If we're not able to begin to practice democracy, we are unlikely to be able to save democracy. And when we say democracy, we should be clear. Democracy simply means that people have the power to shape the government under which they live, right? That they have a say, that they have agency that elected officials are transparent and accountable. And we get to practice that within our own organizations. The third is to meet with elected officials, meet with local elected officials. Let them know that you see this as a problem, right? Ask them to come back to you with solutions that they think might be worth pursuing. These are some of the things that we can do. Make a quilt, 
that represents the values of your community. Put a sign on your lawn, right? Hang something from your doorbell or a bumper sticker on your car. It doesn't have to be the march on Washington. It doesn't have to be the Selma march. It simply has to be the first step that says, without apology, that we believe everyone has the right to live, love, and work free from fear and bigotry. And we are unapologetic about that, that that is the hope of this country, and we seek to make it real. That's what it means to push back against white nationalism. I'm so glad we're having this conversation. You know, I think for a lot of people, it's like, oh, you know, like Nazi skinheads, neo-Nazis. But now you've got people literally in the White House advising the president who wear suits, That's right. who are clear white nationalists. It's so true. I mean, I, I think you were exactly right about that. And it's interesting, right? I mean, we have gone um, in 1980 from Klansmen, right, personified by uh, former Klan leader David Duke and his Klan robes and his swastikas, right, to 2019, people wearing suits, going to law school, running for public office. It is the, the mainstreaming of, of white nationalism. And it started in the shadows of the victory of the civil rights movement. And it has grown steadily ever since. But the truth is, is despite how much it's grown, right, as you know, there are more of us who believe in an inclusive democracy than who believe in these values of violence and exclusion. There are more of us. But if we don't use our voices, if we don't utilize our own freedom of speech, our own freedom of assembly, we're going to know that we are in the majority. And it's important that folks see us and they hear our moral voices in this country today. I think that's a really good point, you know, to remember the, you know, the kind of like strength in numbers and that there are more people that have this vision or would be uh, in favor of this multiracial, multicultural democracy, you know? And I think it's easy to forget that these days, you know, at least for me, it is. I'll be honest about it. It's hard, right? Yeah, it's, it's hard when you see what's going on, you know, on a daily basis. And I think it's also hard when, you know, people are busy, right? People are working there, taking care of their families, working. And to then have to like do this extra thing to organize against uh, of this large movement and all these political forces, I think is really hard. It's so hard. It's, um, you know, I, it, it, and it's meant to isolate, right? It's, to, it's you know, all of this pressure and, and violence and then, you know, the irresponsible rhetoric from elected officials. All of this is meant to make us feel isolated and alone, right? The, the idea that we don't have anything in common. And, you know, I, I reflect on this. When I was in seventh grade in Long Beach, California, it was just when desegregation was starting in the Long Beach uh, Unified School District. So I had to, like, ride a bus to my junior high school. But it was a city bus, right? So I would get off the city bus and then have to walk another, I don't know, I'm going to guess four or five blocks. You can't imagine how much I was taunted. People driving by, shouting out monkey, calling me ape, the N-word, yelling, you know, terrifying things. Now, I'm in seventh grade, right? right? I am just a little kid who is, you know, and you know how, I mean, you know how awkward junior high school, middle school is. I'm just trying to get through my days in dealing with this. Now, I know I'm not alone, right? This is happening to other students as well. What I realized is that it, had ha- it happened so much over seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, right? Over two junior, high- junior highs that I attended. I never once thought about telling my parents. I was embarrassed to tell my mom that I was treated that way, right? I never told teachers, right? I didn't want to create problems, right? I didn't want to be visible. Who wants to be visible in junior high school? I put up with that for three years, right? And I just imagine how isolating that felt. And I imagine 
even if I had told folks, they would have probably told me it was no big deal, mm-hmm. right? Just, just get over it. Focus on your studies, right? And I think about that today, particularly for Jews, for Muslims, for, for immigrants. You know, it is such an isolating and frightening moment. And we live in a culture that won't allow those communities to admit that or understand that the purpose of putting this increased pressure and threats on those communities is to make them feel isolated, to make them feel alienated, to make them want to hide. And right now, what I can say as an African-American is we can't, none of us can afford to hide, that we have to lean into one another. And it doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything, but what we can agree on is that bigotry and violence have no place in our society, right? That harassment, threats, and intimidation have no value or space as we practice democracy. And three, this is the hardest, that white nationalists and the alt-right are not monsters in the closet, right? That they are individuals with a specific worldview. Some of them are willing to lean into violence, right? But the majority of society isn't seeking violent solutions. They are seeking a solution to what it means to be in a society that is shifting in terms of demographics, shifting in terms of income inequality. And those are things that all of us, regardless of where we are on the political spectrum, can come together to address, right? This moment, I, I would just say, I, I, you know, I'd be curious how you feel, but my sense is I tell folks, don't think of the big picture right now. It's actually not particularly useful. It is overwhelming, right? Turning on the news is overwhelming. What you can do, though, is to look at your local community. We fight white nationalism by addressing homelessness. We fight white nationalism, right? by helping kids get into schools, right? That are integrated, integrated public transportation, integration in our public spaces, countering and supporting victims of hate crimes in our community, coming together across lines of race and gender and ethnicity to just break bread together and to just hear one another's stories is a response to white nationalism. We have been taught that unless we are reaching the level of of rhetoric and and hysteria that the white nationalist movement uh, is is putting out there, that we are ineffective. But it's not true. Doing one simple thing, right, is enough to break the paralysis here. And what I tell folks is just find that one thing, right? Write a song send $10 to an organization with a note who you might not normally speak to and just tell them they're important, right? Even if you don't agree with all their issues, make a dinner in your neighborhood, hold a block party, attend a government meeting, write a note to an elected official. It doesn't have to be everything. And as some folks say in the Jewish community, right? Treat each step as it was its own complete step in victory on its own. That's how we fight white nationalism. You know, you've you've really got a hopeful message, and I appreciate that so much. And I think it's even more powerful since I know, you know, how long you've been doing this work, you know, before Western State Center and, you know, going way back. So I was actually hoping you could talk a little bit about how you got into this work. Mm. You know, look, I mean, I was a victim of hate crimes as a, uh, as a child and, um, it really shaped my life. I mean, uh, there was a point where I didn't want to run. I didn't want to be afraid anymore. I didn't want to feel afraid. And, you know, there, w- there were two ways of doing that, right? It was either just isolating myself completely, or it was really kind of taking that first step out there and saying, I'm not going to run. Right. You know, I think I also didn't want anyone else to experience what I had experienced, Um, that feeling of fear and and isolation. 
that really shaped my life, right? My mother shaped my life, um, you know, constantly keeping me engaged in, in community service projects, you know, but for me, it was really the music scene of the 1980s in Los Angeles, the punk scene uh, and the hardcore scene there that really influenced me. It, um, you know, it gave me a little edge. It found a, a way for this kind of uh, 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 awkward kid to kind of express himself. It spoke in many ways, just like hip hop to, to my experience. And it was in that music scene that um, I learned that, you know, bigotry wasn't okay, right? That there were other folks uh, who thought that it wasn't important. And it happened at a time where white power skinheads were attempting to threaten that scene. They were threatening and attacking people uh, inside that scene. So imagine I survived junior high school, right? Get into to high school. And then the music scene that I come to love is facing the same threats that I faced as, uh, uh, you know, between seventh and ninth grade. Yeah. And I was just, you know, I was like, no way, <laughs> right? We're not doing this again. And so there were others, my friends and, and others who were like, we are drawing a moral line against uh, bigotry, right? Um, these are folks who are trying to make us choose between our friends because some are people of color, some are gay, right? Some are liberal art students, right? And we just thought no one gets to define the scene except the people who actually are from the scene. And I think we stood, we stood by each other and it wasn't always easy and it was often scary, right? There weren't no adults around and, but we really wanted to fight for what we believed in. And it was in that fighting that I realized that other folks had the right to their lives as well. And so I brought some of those tools when I moved to Eugene, Oregon in, in the mid eighties and um, ended up um, being part of coalitions that took on the white power scene in the Pacific Northwest. We worked in rural and urban communities in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Colorado, and Wyoming. There was a plethora of organizations, so I'm not taking all the credit, but we built about 120 human rights groups across the region that were made up of conservatives and liberals, right? And radicals and libertarians, right? And the business owners and the punk rockers, the farmer and the law enforcement agent to the human rights activist. And we may not have agreed on everything, as I said before, but we did agree that bigotry didn't have a space. And that, uh, again, we were going to help communities organize to show that there were more of folks who believed in America than folks who wanted to, 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 to burn it down with hate and bigotry. Is it true that you helped start the Black Student Union at the University of Oregon? So I, didn't, I was a co-director of the Black Student Union um, at the University of Oregon in the midst of the anti-apartheid movement. And so um, I wish I could say I, I started but, you know, we did start, um, you know, I was co-director of Students Against Apartheid, the student of, uh, co-director of the Black Student Union, I was very active in the Black Student Union. But I did help to go on to kind of shape the University of Oregon's multi first multicultural center. Um, and, you know, really did a lot of shaping around the purpose of uh, multiculturalism Right, the purpose of, of identity politics uh, as a path to empowerment, right? A, a way of everyone rediscovering uh, their humanity. Because I believe if you discover your humanity, you can recognize the humanity in others. Um, so I was a very active student on, on the campus of the University of Oregon, probably more so uh, than, than I should, because, you know, it was way more fun to get out there organizing uh, than it was to sit in a class. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really cool to have you on here because I transferred to the University of Oregon after many years of not being in school, and I found a home in the Multicultural Center for sure, and some of some really good friends came out of there, and we worked on some great stuff. So 
you know, to have you on here as someone who created that is just, it's just really an honor for me. And, you know, thank you so much for all that work you put in. Thanks. So well, it was uh, a pleasure and, you know, I'm always giving credit out, you know, I think of, uh, you know, folks like Deanna Puente and then Steve Marzumi and, and others who really like did the hard work, right? I got to drop a great idea and, and then walk. And then of course, you know, everyone else had to, to, to build it, but it really was a phenomenal space. And, you know, there is now a new, right? They've taken that and now evolved it into a whole new multicultural center at the University of Oregon that will continue to bring together folks, right? I mean, my era as a student activist at the University of Oregon, you know, was a time where we brought, you know, the Jewish Student Union, right, the LGBTQ Student Union, Native American Student Union, Asian American Pacific Islander, right? Um, I mean, almost every group you could think of together. And while that may not seem like a big deal now, in the 80s, it was a really big deal, right? I remember arguing with, uh, uh, at the time, friendly, with the head of the Jewish Student Union then, right, that they needed to be in this multicultural space, right? Um, and um, I, I think it really, uh, it created a really powerful table because there were so many different representations at that table, right, from the Women's Center to, uh, to others. And it allowed us, I think, to, to really frame an important discourse on the campus um, that really impacted people um, uh, for decades to come. Yeah, I mean, I, I can say for sure that I would not have some of the worldview that I have today if it weren't for the conversations, you know, and the relationships that I built there, for sure. Oh, that's, a, that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. See, I'm giving a circle up for the ducks. No yeah, one else can see ducks, it right now. Go ducks. Go so ducks. I'm going to give a little love to the ducks right now. People listening are going to be like, what? Ducks? But Oregon right, ducks. Right. What's the ducks? That's right. So, you know, as we're kind of wrapping things up, I just want to give you the opportunity if there's anything, you you know, you want to add so that, you know, listeners can hear before we wrap things up here. Go for it. Yeah. Look, I want to thank folks for, for listening. And I hope you will check out um, some of our stuff at, at Western State Center. You can on our website, which is Western State Center. Uh, .org, you can get access to some of our resources, such as our Confronting Nationalism in Schools Toolkit or Indigenizing Love, a, a toolkit for Native youth to build inclusion, um, and, and other resources. Be in touch with us on, on social media, Twitter, right? You can find me at Bulldog Shadow, which was going to be my pro wrestling name when I was seven, <laughs> right? And um, uh, sometimes on Twitter, it feels like it. But, you know, mainly what I want to say is it is easy to despair. And I'm telling you as a person who has done organizing against the white nationalist movement uh, for over three decades, right? To, to remember that there are more of us but we have to be in movement and we have to be in action. This is not a time to sit back. And what I tell folks, uh, how I end most of my talks is, you know, the last thing I'll say here, you know, when we were poor kids, right, in Long Beach in August, we would have been out of school already for almost two and a half months. We didn't have anything to do. We didn't have any money. So we played this game called If I Were. And if I were, we'd sit in a circle and each of us would say, you know, if I were, for instance, in a lion's cage and the lion got out, here's what I would do, right? And then we'd argue for the next half hour about what we would or wouldn't do and if it was realistic. But the one question that always came up was, if I were in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, here's what I would do. And we had lots of bravado about what we would or wouldn't do. We didn't understand choices, choices. We had no idea of what our parents had grown up under, right? We just didn't understand it. The funny thing, though, is that question has always haunted me, right? What would I have done in the midst of the civil rights movement? And what I know now 
is that other folks have asked themselves that same question, right? How would I have acted? And if not the civil rights movement, maybe another historical period. Well, what I'll tell listeners is this. We don't have to wonder any longer. The truth is, is that we are now sitting in a moment that whatever it is we would have done in the midst of the civil rights movement of the 1960s is likely whatever it is we do today when this podcast ends, right? And what I want to tell people is to make it count, make it matter, right? We are in a historical moment that will define the United States of America for at least a generation. And we owe it to the generation that follows us, our children, our grandchildren, to give them the best path to a real democracy that can respond to the real complex problems that we face. We owe it to them and we owe it to ourselves. Well said, Eric. Well said. That was great, man. And I, you know, I just can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast and for doing the work out in the community. Such a pleasure. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for listening to Doing the Work, Frontline Stories of Social Change. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please follow on Twitter and leave positive reviews on iTunes. If you're interested in being a guest or know someone who's doing great work, please get in touch. And thank you for doing real work to make this world a better place. 